Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for the promises of the scripture that both challenge and confront us and comfort us. <clears throat> we thank you for the gift of music. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote that text that Mark was so lucky to get to read today. It's a doozy of a text um, when I read that chapter 15 because the Apostle Paul, um, well, he likes to use a lot of words and he also um, doesn't use many commas or periods. He has very long sentences and uh, it's a complicated text but it is kind of addressing the core of our faith. A little bit about Paul first. Um, the Apostle Paul would have loved that hymn about grace, and because he was in a desert where he was experiencing um, real trials, because Paul describes himself as the least of the apostles. He says, I am the least of the apostles. I am not even worthy to be called an apostle of Jesus because he was a persecutor of the young church. He was actually someone who set out to kill Christians for their faith in Jesus Christ, and he had a conversion experience where he came to understand grace. It was indeed like a spring in the desert when he discovered the gift of grace, that Jesus forgave even the likes of him. And so um, it was this transformation that um, he's addressing when he says he's not worthy. And sometimes we may not feel worthy. We may not feel worthy to be forgiven by this God who loves us so much. But it is through these waters of baptism, it is through the promises of Jesus Christ, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, that Paul proclaims hope for us <clears throat> each and every day. So Paul writes and is having a dialogue with the people in Corinth, the young church in Corinth. Now, the words that we hear today in chapter 15 are some of the oldest we have in Scripture. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is thought to be the first letter, or at least the oldest letter we have. This portion of 1 Corinthians also, it predates the Gospels even, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Apostle Paul is having this dialogue with the church of Corinth. Because in the first century, this new, young Christian church, there's a lot of ideas out there about what happens after you die. In many ways, the first century church is a lot like our 21st century. A lot of questions, a lot of what happens, and, you know, do we believe that? Do we believe that? And a lot of questions about what happens after we die. And the Apostle Paul writes that because Jesus died and rose, so will we. Because Jesus died an earthly death, and that's why in the creeds we hear that he suffered, he died, he was buried. He wasn't a spiritual being that didn't suffer. He was a physical being that suffered this death. But the grave could not hold him. As the text says, the last enemy death will not have the final word. Jesus was physically resurrected to new life. He was not resuscitated. He was resurrected. He was really dead, and he really rose to new life. And for us, too, when our bodies no longer have breath, when our Lord receives us, that is when we will be resurrected in Jesus Christ. This is a hope and promise that is ours. It begins at the 9 o'clock service. We baptize baby Emily. Emily, uh, Emily, who we prayed for all those months. Even before the twins were born, we prayed for them. Her sister Claire and Emily were baptized on New Year's Eve. Claire died shortly thereafter, just a little over one pound. But today we were able to affirm the baptismal promise of Emily, who's now, what was she, 13 pounds? 
and perfect. It was wonderful. The flowers that are here, these beautiful flowers, are from the funeral of Cleta Peering yesterday. Cleta, at 9 o'clock, sat on the left side. She was kind of a stitch. Uh, she was quite an amazing woman. And um, Cleta received her baptismal inheritance. So in these days, we have acknowledged birth and death and the promises that come through baptism. The promise that we have that assurance of eternal life held out before us. And again, as Paul says, it's all about grace. It's not that we're so good, it's that we have such a great God who loves us, forgives us, and claims us. In the new uh, Lutheran magazine, it's called Living Lutheran. There's some copies around the church, and I invite you to pick up a copy or, or um, subscribe to it. There's an article about Aunt Helen, not my Aunt Helen, but Aunt Helen. And Aunt Helen was baptized at 100 years old. It's a wonderful story. She lived in Sarasota, Florida, and um, she did not grow up in a church home. And uh, she went through life, and as she was aging, her world became smaller and smaller, family passing away, friends passing away, until a nephew from up north in the Midwest started seeing her on a, an occasion when he was down for business. And then after retirement, he and his wife would spend winters in Sarasota. And they, they developed this fast and wonderful relationship reacquainting nephew and aunt. And in time, she came to church with them. And she, like the Apostle Paul, heard the story of Jesus. And she heard it like a spring in the desert. She heard it as good news for her life. And after she turned 100, a few months later, she said to her nephew that she wanted to be baptized. This story that we claim in Jesus Christ. This one who lived, who died, and who was resurrected is our hope and our promise. It's never too late. It wasn't too late for Anne Helen. She, of course, God had loved her throughout her life, but now she recognized and affirmed that love through her baptism. So the Apostle Paul says to us in the midst of all these words to the Corinthians, he's not just debating to them, but he wants them to know this faith because they're surrounded by all these other messages in Greece. And so he says, I want to pass on to you what I have first heard. I want to pass on to you what I have heard first heard, what has been shared with me has given me faith, and now I want to share it with you. And he wants to be there and to hear their questions and their doubts and their questionings. And as he says that to the Corinth church, he says it to us. So my question for you right now is to talk to a neighbor, and if you're not sitting by somebody, get up and go talk to somebody. Who passed on the faith to you? I'm going to give you like 45 seconds. Who pass on the faith? Maybe 56. Um, who pass on the faith to you? Tell somebody that you're sitting by. Who helped pass on the faith? Thank you. And if you didn't get to finish, you can finish after church telling those stories. I'm, I'm guessing for some of you it might have been 
a parent, a mother, a father. For some of you, it was a neighbor. For some of you, it may have been an aunt, a grandparent, a friend, a spouse. I think of, um, in addition to my parents, I think of Mrs. Chorlian, who was our music teacher in Sunday school. Um, And through her gift of music and through our openings, the faith was passed on to us. I think of Mrs. Balchunas, who uh, was my kindergarten teacher in Sunday school. And um, I don't think I remember the, I I know I don't remember the lessons, but something took, obviously. But I do remember her person, her presence, that she was patient with this group of kindergartners and that somehow she just reflected Jesus in her person and being with us. So now it is our turn to say yes and to pass on what we have first heard, what has been communicated to us to share to others, both within these church doors to our precious children. I love watching those pictures. We are so blessed with our children here at Holy Cross. Or to pass that on to people outside these church doors. It is such a wonderful gift that we have to share, that death does not have the final word, that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead, and that this is our gift and hope and promise, and we need to pass it on. God bless you all. Let's sing your song as we continue.